And now to introduce our program, the president of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Thomas Check. Good morning and welcome back to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and to the 2005 Holiday Lectures on Science, Evolution, Constant Change, and Common Threads. In his last lecture, David Kingsley talked about domestication of wolves into dogs and of teosinte into corn. Today, he's going to delve deeper into evolutionary time and show us about how genetic changes in living populations today relate to changes that we see in the fossil record. Now, David primarily studies fish, but the rules and mechanisms that he has uncovered have broad implications for the evolution of all kinds of species, including humans. One of the surprising things that David has discovered is that evolution appears to be a great recycler, using the same mechanisms over and over again. The talk is entitled, Fossils, Genes, and Embryos. And now, here's a video of David at work. For me, why I went into science and one of the most rewarding things about it is the rare opportunity to get to spend your life on solving problems or studying questions that people have wondered about for um, thousands of years. Uh, I think we live right now at a time when the techniques are available to pick any problem that you're interested in. and so is this one a get to be the, from the, the one who solves uh, some age-old problem. How does that and time? that's, I think, a fairly unusual opportunity. But for a long time, the problems weren't solved because the methods weren't available to work on them. What's different now is that the methods are available to work on them. So I think 100 years from now, people will look back and say, that must have been an incredible time to be doing science. The methods were there. And all you had to do was pick the problem you were interested in and go apply the methods. And uh, what could be more exciting than to live in that sliver of time when wonderful unsolved problems are solvable uh, by the application of methods that have worked repeatedly in other areas? There's no other job in the world where you can have the privilege of getting to spend your time trying to figure out how things work. I think it's important for students not to decide whether they like science based just on the way science has been presented to them in, in a few classes. So if you can find some way uh, to get into a lab or to interact with scientists doing science, that it's the best possible way to see the difference between the problem solving that scientists really do and the way it's normally uh, presented in the classroom. And there's a big difference between memorizing the words that scientists use and actually doing science. And I think that people have to get past that nomenclature uh, aspect and get into a uh, lab environment where they can actually do science. And that means to be confronted with a problem where the answer isn't known. So don't memorize the answer, try to find the answer. Welcome back, everybody. Yesterday, uh, we saw how selection by humans uh, has transformed plants and animals into uh, the modern forms that we see around us today. Darwin and Wallace uh, both realized that the same principles of selection that have so dramatically uh, changed both plants and animals uh, under domestication should also act in nature so while plants and animals uh, vary in all directions, the differences are inherited. Many more individuals are produced than can possibly survive and reproduce, so that creates a competitive situation. Favorable variants will inevitably leave more offspring, and these laws of nature create a process of natural selection that will extensively modify organisms over time. So based on these laws, Darwin proposed that modern plants and animals are really just the youngest sprouts and twigs of an immense and ancient uh, tree of life, and that all organisms, 
that have ever lived may be related by descent with modification extending back to the very earliest stages of uh, life on Earth. Now, that I think is obviously a profound intellectual uh, leap. It's always struck me as large as the leap uh, that was made by Newton. Many of you know Newton, uh, he saw an apple falling in his backyard and realized that the same forces of gravity that control objects falling uh, in his backyard might also control the falling of the moon around the Earth, the orbiting of the Earth around the sun, and in fact, the principles that construct the entire solar system. So Newton's scope for physics was uh, incredible, from, from apples to orbits, from his backyard to the entire solar system. And I think Darwin's uh, book had a similar breathtaking scope from uh, pigeons in his backyard, in the very first chapter of The Origin of Species, to this immense tree of life that connects all living forms by modification, by descent, uh, by the final chapter of the origin. Okay, so when in 1859, uh, when Darwin's great theory was proposed, it already explained all sorts of confusing data from different uh, areas, including uh, odd facts from biogeography, the, uh, the existence of closely related organisms and island groups uh, like the Galapagos, Facts from paleontology, like the fact that uh, modern mammals are only found in the most recent fossil strata. Facts from embryology, common structures are seen in the embryos of animals that look very different from each other. And unusual facts from morphology. So comparative anatomists had known for a long time that some structures existed in animals that were very hard to explain under the prevailing idea that each species had been intelligently designed to optimally match uh, its, its own environment. For example, lots of animals that live in caves never see light. They have no reason to have eyes. And yet lots of cave animals have vestigial eyes. So eyes begin to form. Or they form and they degenerate. Or they form but they're completely covered by skin. So these are non-functional organs in an environment where eyes aren't needed. Very hard to imagine why they're there if each organism was designed to live in a cave, but easy to explain if current blind animals evolved from precursors that used to see. So descent with modification explains these structures as a vestige, a leftover from their common ancestry. Well, although uh, Darwin's theory explained lots of peculiar facts that existed in 1859, it also uh, set off a whole series of raging debates about all sorts of uh, other issues. Many scientists believe the Earth was too young uh, to be compatible with Darwin's theory of evolution when it was published in 1859. There was an absence of transitional forms that Darwin predicted should be all over the place uh, in the fossil record. Many people thought natural selection couldn't work the way Darwin proposed because any rare variants that occurred uh, would get swamped out by a form of blending inheritance that we'll come back to in a second. And finally, many people just fundamentally thought that animals look too different from each other to have possibly come uh, from common ancestors. So all of these issues were extensively uh, debated uh, during Darwin's lifetime. He tried to address them in subsequent issues of the origin of species, but in fact, many of them weren't resolved uh, for decades. So let's come back and uh, talk about, about uh, each of these uh, key, key problems. Okay, how about the age of the Earth? The age of the Earth has been calculated uh, in lots of different ways. There was a famous calculation by Archbishop Usher in the 1600s that creation had occurred on October 23rd, 4004 BC. That estimate was based on uh, genealogy in the Bible. So in the 1800s, there was already accumulating geological evidence that the Earth must be uh, much older than that. One of Darwin's contemporaries was a famous physicist uh, named Lord Kelvin. How many of you guys have ever heard of uh, Kelvin? Right, this is the Kelvin of the second law of thermodynamics. This is also the Kelvin of the absolute temperature scale. So the degrees are named after uh, Lord Kelvin, one of the most famous physicists of, of the 1800s. So Kelvin had calculated uh, that the Earth couldn't be older than uh, the Earth and Sun uh, had a maximum age of 40 million years. That was the, based on the physics of the cooling of the Earth and Sun. That estimate bar bothered Darwin a lot.